All right, so two weeks ago, we began a journey and jumped into a passage in Ephesians 4, uh, looking at something that Paul talks about, uh, a work of Jesus, gives us some insight into Jesus's vision and design for his church. And we're looking at it because it's a passage that, for whatever reason, often gets misread or just kind of disregarded. Uh, But we really believe, I really believe that this is a turnkey uh, for Jesus's church and beginning to step into what he has for us, and it's something that's relevant to each and every one of us who confess that Jesus is Lord. And so we're going to just, for those of you who weren't here two weeks, like very quick, kind of bringing you up to date. So Ephesians 4, uh, this is what we read. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Jumping to verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ has apportioned it. And this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives, and this is key right here for us, he gave gifts to his people. And then verse 11, what are those gifts? So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors or shepherds, depending on your translation, and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. All right, so there's a lot there, but just hitting on kind of the main points to set us up back up for this. Again, huge to remember that this is uh, not a leadership text, all right? So he's not talking to the religious professionals. He is talking to the people of God. So the whole body, all the micro churches and people gathered around tables in Ephesus, this is for everybody. Um, we're told that every single one of us who confesses that Jesus is Lord have been given gifts by Jesus. They're apportioned to us by his grace uh, so that we can together, what's up, man? So we can build each other up, mature, uh, that the fullness of God's character and presence can be experienced in this place, in the community of faith, and also through us as we uh, partner with God is up to in the world. And that no gift is greater, right? So it doesn't matter who has the microphone, who gets paid, who doesn't get paid, uh, whether you have been to seminary or you've been to prison, doesn't matter, right? Everybody's gift is necessary. We need everybody to step in and to begin to lean into this and to use the gifts that God has put in them uh, so that we can experience God's fullness and God can do through us what he wants to do through us. And he makes a really big deal, I don't know if you caught it, about unity, right? So before he even gets to, hey, these are the five gifts that God gives to the church, he's like, you're gonna have to fight for this, right? He uses the word one seven times in that one like run-on sentence. I don't know if you caught it, right? And so he's saying, this is not gonna come easy. This is actually a recipe for conflict, Right, so just expect that. Know that that's part of the beauty and diversity uh, of Jesus's church. Um, so uh, I will say this: so sometimes I get this conversation whenever we talk about apest, and that is there's like a hesitancy. Uh, probably it's probably linked to some kind of enneagram type, you know, like the hesitation of like, don't put me in a box, don't kind of type me, you know, don't paint me into a corner. I'm a unique snowflake, and you are right. But and, and nobody wants to be put in a box. But the truth is, if you look at these five things, one of the things we're going to look at as we dig deeper in a past is that every single one of us have, on some level, these five gifts in us. And typically there's one, two, maybe three that are, that are stronger than others. But if you look at that five, right? And so, like, so for me, like mine is uh, A-E-T-P-S, right? So that's kind of like my five. If you look at those, there's 120 different variations of those letters. So your unique makeup is very, very unique. And that doesn't take into consideration just how, the ways in which you are gifted, say, as an apostle or a prophet or evangelist, shepherd, teacher, and how it's important to you. There, if you look at that, there's millions of variations. So this is not about trying to type somebody or put them, paint them into a corner or put them in a box. This is really about growing in both self-awareness so we can live into these things, lean into these things, but also growing in others' awareness so we can 
fan into flame what the Spirit is putting the people around our table, right? And around our tables at home and in this room, right? And call forth those things and unleash those things uh, in them. So, so if you haven't taken the assessment yet, I know we haven't sent over the link, though this week... I didn't feel too much of a hurry because if you're gifted apostolically, uh, this one's a little bit easier to kind of self-type yourself if it's in you. Um, but there's two questions you can ask if you have never taken like a formal assessment around APEST. That will give you really good insight into how you are wired, all right? So the first would be, uh, what energizes you, right? So when we talk about these, these different gifts, and actually you can throw them up there. Uh, I think I've got the, each one just like one sentence for all five, for those who weren't here. Do I have that slide? Where's the apostles, the one who, the one who sent and extends, prophet, the one who questions and reforms, evangelist, the one who recruits and gathers, shepherd, the one who protects and provides, and teacher, the one who understands and explains. So even as like in reading this brief, just one little sentence, right? As you think about those kinds of activities that are associated with that, like what energizes you? versus what sucks the life out of you. Um, the other question is, answering the question, what is the biggest problem in the church? Because chances are, whichever way that you are wired, you're gonna answer in such a way as to how God has gifted you, right? You ask a teacher, what is wrong with the church? And they're gonna tell you biblical fluency. Our people don't know their Bibles, right? They don't know the word of God. How can they possibly live faithfully if they don't understand, right? You ask somebody like me, who's wired more apostolically, right, I'm probably going to answer in the flesh, maybe in the moment, something like, we got a bunch of lazy Christians who sit on their butts and don't do anything outside of the four walls of the church, who don't know their neighbors and don't care about the kingdom, and they aren't starting things, right? And so you can hear that. It's like, well, that actually has more to do with me, maybe, than it does actually uh, the answer the question. But it does give you some insight into, into maybe how God has wired you. Um, another thing I'll say is one of the reasons this is incredibly important for us to be talking about is for the last century or so, in the Western church at least, we have taken one or two of these gifts and we've really elevated them above the others. Um, and I probably, I mean, you know where I'm going with this probably, and that's these two right here. All right, for whatever reason, over the decades, the way that we define spiritual maturity has almost exclusively been defined by shepherds and teachers. Right? I think if we could all like had time to go through our stories and think about our own kind of church history, churches that we grew up in or maybe we met Christ in, uh, churches that you were part of before you moved to Knoxville or before you found your way here, the vast majority of paid pastoral staff tend to be gifted in one or both of these areas. And this, this creates a problem, right? One if Paul is telling the truth and the scriptures are inspired and true, we're potentially missing 60 plus percent of God's character and presence being expressed in and through the body. If this is primarily how we're defining spiritual maturity. Right, the other problem that it's created is that for people who are the apes, apostles, prophets, evangelists, the apes, um, and this is part of my story, probably part of a number of your stories, church can it can be very hard to find a home in church and to feel like you really belong, right? Because spiritual maturity is being defined in a way that, you know, in areas that maybe you're not, I'm not the strongest in. And also, generally speaking, when past shepherds and teachers are leading the way in creating culture, there's not a lot of space for these three to use their gifts, right? And so spiritual maturity does become caring for the people in the room, and studying our Bibles, which are both great things that need to happen. But for those who are sent to, you know, the people who live sent and are trying to help the church live sent and extend, and those who are constantly questioning and reforming, stepping into a humanitarian work and into the arts, people who are evangelists who care deeply about people who don't know Jesus and aren't walking through the doors, have a really hard time finding their place sometimes. And so what's happened over the decades is... Uh, we've watched a pretty big exit of these three groups, certainly vocationally and professionally, but, but also in the, where they're putting their, their time, the, the direction in which they're dreaming 
uh, what they're laboring to create. So, you know, those who are wired more apostolically, more entrepreneurially, generally speaking, a lot of them found their way into the business sector, right, where they could actually put those entrepreneurial gifts to work. Uh, profits um, have really struggled to find their place, and we'll talk more about that in two weeks when we talk about profits. Uh, those who are questioning and reforming and doubting and calling us back to the holiness of God, looking for people on the margins, uh, they, generally speaking, have found their way into humanitarian work and into the arts. Right, evangelists, those who recruit, gather, those, especially those who are more, they care deeply about those who are sojourners, they don't yet know Jesus as Lord, have often found themselves into the nonprofit sector and into parachurch ministry. And so now, generally speaking, we have church cultures that are almost exclusively shaped by these two, which is hugely problematic, uh, according to according to the Apostle Paul. So we've we've lost we've lost the apes. Um, how are we doing on time? Four, five, four fifty-two. All right. So I'll give you just a quick throw up the next uh, table, if you will. All right. So here's part of the reason this is really problematic when most of the church is operating in this space. And these people aren't given space to use their gifts. And we're not fanning into flame and, and, and letting them loose. Right? Shepherd teachers tend to be reluctant to change. Apostle prophets, evangelists, the apes, they're typically restless without change. Right? Shepherd teachers desire to manage long-standing ministries and keep them operating. They care deeply about people. There's almost like a legacy quality to their heart. Right? And so they're thinking about all the people whose lives have been impacted through these ministries. They want to see it going. They don't want to dishonor that. Whereas apes are, they have an impulse to eliminate ineffective ministries and put resources into starting new things. Right? So you're starting to see where some clashing can happen. Uh, shepherd teachers called to serve those inside of the church. Apes called to serve and reach those outside of the church. Shepherd teachers tend to be cautious and they move slowly. Right? They're not going to jump into something without really thinking it through, having a very good plan. Um, apes are, they tend to take risks and move too fast if they're not careful. And then shepherd teachers, desi- there's a deep desire for, desire for safety and preservation. Whereas with apostles, prophets, evangelists, there's a deep desire for risk taking and expansion. All right. So you can start to get a picture of why I think Paul, before he even got here was like unity guys, before I say anything else, you're going to have to fight for this, uh, because this is absolutely, um, It's a recipe for conflict. And it's not that one is right and one is wrong. Like you can see the beauty and the value in both, right? Like how badly we need both. And again, these are rooted in the character of God. And so we we do need need all of them working. So that said, um, that is part of what makes being a part of a spiritual community so hard. But it's also part of what makes being a part of a spiritual community so beautiful. Right, And so, again, the desire in this, some of this is to grow in language for this, but also for vision for this, so that we can be more gracious, gracious towards one another as we call these things out and work together. So um, I'm going to skip ahead, too. Let's talk about the apostles. All right. So speaking of the apostles, um, I'm going to skip. T- I'm going to give you two pages of notes in, like, 20 seconds. All right. Again, these are rooted in the character of God, right? And so when we talk about God the Father, right, he is a sent and sending God. The whole triune God is, right? So, God, so the Father is involved in everything that is happening. The Father sends the Son, right, who lives sent among us. The Father and Son send the Spirit. And then the Father, send, Son, and Spirit send to the church, right? We we worship a God who's on mission in this world, who's committed to re- reconciling all things back to himself. He's taking all of creation somewhere, right? Jesus is the pioneer perfecter of our faith. This is rooted in who God is, right? Again, this isn't new. This isn't unique. This isn't something that is just coming out of left field, right? This is, this is true to the character of God. So skipping ahead. Um, the apostles, right? All of us are called, by the way, that's why you can't be faithful and not live sent. It is not possible, right? To not participate in what God is doing in the world is to not only miss a deep and important part of who God is, but it's also to miss a deep and important part of who you are. And the apostles are the ones who are constantly reminding of this, us of this, right? They're not only creating new works, they're also pioneering new pathways for other people to live sent 
who might not otherwise live sent. So an apostle, as we said, is one who is sent and extends. So some key words for an apostle, uh, if you weren't here last week. Entrepreneur, uh, innovator, pioneer. Uh, Nathan Brewer writes this. Um, apostolic individuals are uniquely gifted by Jesus to innovate, innovatively start new ventures in new places, inspiring expansion of the kingdom of God. Right? And so there's often an, an entrepreneurial quality uh, to those who, who are gifted apostolically. So um, this, this particular one takes like the least amount of prep for me because this is, this is my top one, right? So uh, the way that APES works, because... Um, every person is created in the image of God and God has sown his own characteristics and goodness into all of creation. This is why we can see this, even though, even though this reflects a character of God, a characteristic of God, why we can see this everywhere, even in people who maybe don't know Jesus yet, right? And what ends up happening is when we come to know Jesus, God takes this raw, latent material that he's placed inside of us and then he redirects it towards kingdom purposes, right? So for me personally, I've always loved to start things. Right, long before I knew Jesus, I just loved it. Just loved doing it all the time. I come to meet Jesus, catch a vision for Jesus's church, and probably not surprising that church planting is what we've been doing for the last 20 years. So we've been a part of of a few new church starts. A uh, couple years in to our last church in Lincoln, um, got some golden advice. Uh, went out to the, we, I went up to the Rocky Mountains with a group of pastors. Our denomination paid for it, and they had a leadership coach who came with us. And we had to do some pre-work and some pre-counseling sessions. And then when we were on the mountain, he kind of synthesized all this stuff and, and helped speak into kind of where we we're at and our pain points and calling and those kinds of things. And one of the things that he said to me, he said, all right, Aaron, you're gifted entrepreneurially. Love, you know, obviously you love to start things. This is one of the ways that God has gifted you. But if you keep trying to scratch that itch in the church, like in your faith community, you're going to kill the church and burn everybody out. And because we had started services and we were starting a sub campus and we started a one year leadership development program um, in the first like 12 months, you know, and so he's just like, you got to stop. And so he said, one of the things I think you need to pray about, and this is Jesus kind of expanding my kingdom vision beyond just the church. And he said, I think you need to pray about uh, potentially starting a nonprofit and or a business on the side and to enable you to stay faithful to where God has called you, present, but also be faithful to the way that God has wired you, right? And for me, as an apostolic type, like that was million-dollar advice. It's pure gold, right? And so that led to helping start the Pillar Seminary in Omaha, um, helping start the Creo Collective, which is our tribe international uh, network of missional practitioners, most of which are in the marketplace and leading small micro communities like this, um, various things. It's the reason that last Friday we sold $15,000 of coffee roasting equipment, which is a dream that is not going to come to fruition, which is kind of sad. Um, but life circumstances, that dream does not fit where we find ourselves currently. But also by Wednesday, I had a had a, uh, a meeting with a business coach and Thursday night I couldn't sleep and I was up till one writing the next business plan, right? It's just like, I can't turn it off. And that might sound super obnoxious to you. I'm sure Megan can relate, right? But for those of us who are wired apostolically, it's just, that's for many of us, like that's just kind of part of the way we're wired. I see Grace, the eyebrows up, nodding passionately, fellow entrepreneur apostolic, right? If we're not if we're not starting the next thing, we're dreaming about the next thing, or we're planning the next thing, just part of the way that, that God has wired us. Um, moving on. That's also, by the way, if you were here a few a couple months ago, Kirk, where's Kirk? Right? You heard Kirk share a bit of his vision for Common Hands, right? Which is this vision to, to, um, to mobilize some of the gifts that God has given our community to build and to fix and do various things in order to step into some of the underserved areas of Knoxville, right? And for the shepherd teachers in the room, you might hear that and know that Kirk's a part of a microchurch already. And be like, what's the deal? Does he not care about his microchurch? Or does he not care about those people already in his room? Well, of course he does. I get, to hear, I get to hear that regularly, right, from Kirk. But as an apostolic, he's always going to be thinking about, well, what about over there? How do we get the church over there? What about this need that's not being met? How do we mobilize the people of God to get there? Right Or last two weeks ago, I had people raise their hand, hey, who thinks apostolic is probably in their 
you know, top one or two, John Drew, I saw your hand go up, right? And then it's like, my first thought was like, well, of course, of course, John Drew's hand is going up, right? You might not know this, I'm sure you'll hear about this probably from here very soon, that John Drew has helped a part of pioneering a work in, in Vestal with Block Ministries, which is another very underserved area. It's like, yeah, of course, John Drew's doing that. She's an apostle. That's just the kind of thing that apostles do. Uh, other key words, um, visionary thinking and motivation. Comfortable crossing boundaries. They are intellectually, socially, culturally. Um, they're often strategic decision makers. Um, this is very good to know for the apostolics around you. If you're not wired this way, they typically are uncomfortable with the status quo, and that's going to annoy you all the time. I apologize in advance. Um, drawn to um, and gifted for oftentimes innovative approaches to solutions. Uh, they see things holistically um, often part of a larger system. Oftentimes they see people this way, right? And so um, people who are wired apostolically, some of them absolutely love coming alongside others and helping them discover this kind of stuff, right? To discover what God has put in them. Uh, J.D. Woodward, this is why he calls them dream awakeners, right? And so they love to see the spirit of God light up like a new dream in the heart of another follower of Jesus, right? It's, the, it's, it's why I love talking about this stuff. Because when the, the, the spirit sparks something and the light comes on and God starts a new work, I mean, for me, there's, there's just nothing, nothing better than that. Um, as mentioned last week, apostles are often described as protectors or custodians of the DNA. <clears throat> Excuse me, the DNA. Um, they tend to have broad networks of relationships that extend beyond the local context. Why? Because they love to be a part of what God is doing, not just here, but over there and over there and over there. So they often are connected uh, to people who are doing work elsewhere. They can be movemental in their thinking. So think like big picture, big vision, right? And so like if you're a very gifted shepherd who's totally dialed into the person God has placed in front of your face, as you should be and we need you to, they're going to drive you nuts in this way as well. Right, because you're thinking like, how, why are you thinking about this in the clouds when we have this this pain and this hurt in the room? These people who need care and attention, right? So those are two different ways apostles and, and shepherds are going to miss each other. Oftentimes, I'll say this. I'm gonna. There's so much more I could say. Gosh, there's never enough time. But there's a there's a different. Sometimes apostles and evangelists kind of have a hard time differentiating the two, and we'll kind of mistype. It's like I think I'm this, or maybe I think I'm that. I'm not really sure. Here's just kind of one illustration of like how apostles and evangelists are very different from each other. Um, evangelists like want to harvest, right? And so evangelists, they are very tuned in to people who are close, close to experiencing the living God in a real way, right? People who have walked through some stuff and, and they're just tender and they're open and they're aware. And it's just like somebody just needs to step up and give language to what they're already sensing, what God has already begun in their lives. And so they're looking for that kind of low-hanging fruit walking through the orchard, and they just want to harvest. Um, apostles are different, right? Apostles, uh, they don't want to pick the low-hanging fruit. They want to plant another orchard, right? And so apostles are looking at this plot of ground that is unworked, and it looks dry and dead and desolate, and they're like, oh, man, if we create the right ecosystem here, like we could plant all kinds of things here. We could, we could put a new orchard there and there and there, right? And so just very, just a very different way that they're, they're wired that for me, that's like a, a helpful thing. So some biblical examples of, of apostles would be um, Paul, for sure. That's an easy one. They call him the apostle Paul, right? Uh, Barnabas, his co-laborer uh, as well. Apollos would be another one. These would be great people to do like character studies on uh, if you're wired apostolically. Uh, Andronicus and Junia in Romans 16 would be another one. Um, Titus would be another one. Some kind of modern examples would be uh, John Wesley, who's the cat catalyst of the Methodist movement. Um, I, I read this week that he rode in his lifetime 250,000 miles by horseback, which... I don't know if this is true, but they said it's enough to circle the earth 10 times. And he did that planting churches and sharing the gospel. To me, that feels inflated a little bit. Um, maybe he did. That's an incredible number. Whatever that number is, uh, that guy was just driven to see churches planted 
and to see people come to know Jesus. And by the time he died, his, the movement, that Methodist movement that started with four people, uh, included 72,000 members in the British Isles and 60,000 in America. So he was a movemental guy. Another one would be uh, Bill Bright, who's the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. Um, he, uh, he did that in the 50s, and then shortly thereafter, he wrote the Four Spiritual Laws, which might be triggering for some of you. Um, I do think that was actually a very helpful tool in the 50s, a little bit different now, but um, he also uh, was uh, one of the creators, co-creators of the Jesus film, which was a huge evangelistic tool. Um, I was a part of that back in the 90s. You know, they'd take this, this incredible film about the life, death, resurrection of Jesus and be translated into local language, and he'd go to these villages and show on the screen in their language the story of Jesus. Um, and so by 2011, they had 25,000 missionaries in 191 countries. Pretty credible. Um, a much more modern, like recent example would be Brian Sanders, founder of the Tampa Underground, um, if you don't know, which was a huge paradigmatic shift, uh, kind of ran lead block for a lot of us, was very inspiring for us, and permission giving in, in starting this. Um, as of now, they have 100 microchurches, I believe, around the Tampa Bay area and like 15 sister movements in other cities around North America, just pretty incredible. And then one that's really close to home, uh, many of you know Mike Gerald, uh, who is a co-founder of the, the Creo Collective and serves as a director, and he's one of our advisors on our directional team. Um, if you don't know about Mike, you know, he was the, the lead pastor of a big growing church, multi-million dollar building product, uh, project, and then he had a life-changing encounter in a bar with a group of atheists and a handful of pastors. And he walked away from all of it to start a single microchurch. And then you fast forward the clock about a decade, and they had 20 microchurches in the, the Philadelphia area, and they accidentally planted another four sister churches. Um, he's a good friend and, and another person. And so I share all those because those are, I mean, obviously those are like big, exaggerated examples, right? Most of us won't do massive stuff. I'm not called to do, probably do anything like that, you know? Um, nobody's going to be talking about me and their message on the other side of the world in 30 years, you know, that kind of a thing. But I think it does like just kind of help give some handles, right? It's like a big exaggerated version of what God has put in some of the people, some of the people in this room. So lastly, I will say this, uh, for all of the strengths and the gifts that the apostolically gifted bring to a community like this, like all of these, there's some shadow sides, right? Some potential weaknesses. This is why we need the rest of you who are not apostolically wired. Here's where we can go wrong. Um, we can get into trouble by uh, moving on too quickly. We have a tendency to do that. Uh, being so focused on the next hill uh, that we miss the people who are right in front of our face. Um, we can find a little bit too much value in achievement at times. Uh, we can be driven, demanding, and insensitive to people in our worst moments. And so we can be, I would say this, too task-oriented, uh, too future-oriented, and too speed-oriented. And so those are some areas where, where we need you. So um, with the time that we have, it's probably not going to be much. Be very quick. Yeah, should we do? Okay. So here's, here's uh, you can throw up the questions here. So here's what I'd love to talk about around our tables. Right, imagine that you were part of a church that was all apostles, right? Just all people wired like what we're talking about. What would that community be like? All right, what would they be really good at? And where would they likely struggle? Sound good? All right, let's do it.